Good morning. How great it is to be here today. So great to see every individual out, and I couldn't think of a better place in all the world to be than right here at the Lafayette Church of Christ. And uh, to you who are visiting, again, we've, we've already said it once, but we want to just keep letting you know how thankful we are that you are here, and we hope and pray that you will come back and uh, be with us every chance you get. Don't run off after services. Give us a chance to, to visit with you and to get to know you and to show you what a wonderful church family that exists here at the Lafayette Church of Christ. Now, I love history. Uh, I, I'm sure probably many of you may have the same kind of love for history. When you think about the words that are before you, words like Gettysburg, Midway, Yorktown, and Alamo, what, what do they have in common? Probably if you're any kind of historian or, or you've, you've studied history, period, you're going to recognize that all of these are what we would refer to as important battles. Not just important battles, but battles that literally change the history and the course of mankind, that they did so much for the American people. What if I were to tell you that there is another battle that we could throw on the PowerPoint, one that you are well aware of that is more important than any one of these battles that we have just listed? What if I were to tell you that battle is more important than all of the battles that have ever been fought combined together? What if I told you that battle was more important than that? Would you believe me? Well, you'd have to because the battle that I'm thinking about is, is not a physical battle. You see, it's our spiritual battle. It's the one that you and I as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, take part in every day that we live. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, there the apostle Paul would write to Timothy and he would say, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. In that passage of scripture, not only is Paul teaching Timothy that he is a soldier in the Lord's army, but when you and I read that passage, it implies that you and I likewise are soldiers in the Lord's army, just as Timothy was. That's why the Apostle Paul would say earlier in the first book that he wrote to Timothy, in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, and encouraged to fight the good fight of faith. That's our goal, to fight every day in the battle that you and I fight in. But what's so special about this battle? What's, what's so significant about this battle? What is it about this battle that lifts it above all other battles? It's what we are fighting for, and it's who we are fighting against. You see, in our spiritual battle, we are literally fighting for our souls. Every individual who is a child of God is in a saved relationship. But when you become a Christian, you become a member of the Lord's army. You become a soldier in His army, and you have the responsibility of fight. And every day you and I go out and we fight against Satan not only to preserve our own souls, but to share a wonderful message found within this book that will help save the souls of the entire world. And that's why our battle is so important. There is no other like it because we are battling for the souls of mankind. Can you think of a greater price? Can you think of anything more valuable than an individual soul? Jesus would say in the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter in verse 24, What is a man profited if he shall gain what? The whole world and lose his soul. There is not a price that you can put on the soul of mankind. And that's why the battle that you and I are involved in is the greatest battle that has ever been known unto man. Now as with any battle... We want to win, right? I've never entered a race with the attitude, well, I hope I come in last. That, that, that's never been my objective. Every race I have ever entered, every football team or basketball or baseball team I have ever rooted for, my goal is that I want them to win or I want to win. And when we think about this spiritual battle that you and I are involved in every day of our lives, if there's one thing we want to do, it's what? I want to see those lips moving. What do we want to do, brethren? We want to win, don't we? We don't want to make it to the end of life and we have lived every day and we have 
did our very best to give everything that we could to be faithful Christians and hear the words, depart from me. We want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. We want that, don't we? You know, in order to win any battle, it doesn't matter what that battle may be, we could go back through the history of time and you name the battle, we could sit down and look at it. In order for an individual or a group to win a battle, there are several different things that they have to keep in mind. They have to know their enemy. They have to know the techniques of their enemy. They have to know the weapons of their enemy. Not only do they need to know their enemy, they need to know their very own strength. They need to come to the conclusion, can I defeat this enemy? And not only that, they need weapons of warfare. And if those three characteristics are not there, then folks, those people are going to fail in that battle. Likewise, the same is true of you and I. We need to know our enemy. We need to know who He is. We need to know His weapons. We need to know how He comes at us. We need to know our strength. We need to know, do we have the ability to defeat this enemy? And we need to know what our weapons are. I suppose that's one of the reasons that I love Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10 and going through verse 18. And I would invite you to open your Bibles there this morning because that's where we are going to camp That's where we're going to take our study from this morning. You see, the book of Ephesians does just exactly, the sixth chapter beginning in verse 10 and going through verse 18 does just exactly what we described. In that passage of Scripture, Paul identifies through the inspiration of God who our enemy is. And not only does he identify our enemy, he tells us his techniques. He tells us about his nature and his sole purpose. Not only does he tell us about our enemy, but he also tells us about the strength that God has provided for you and me so that we can not only defeat our enemy, we can completely and utterly crush him someday. And then he tells us about an armor. He tells us about a weapon or weapons in the plural that God has provided those of us who are true servants of God. And I want us to take the time in our study this morning to look at those points of interest. The very first thing that we want to think about as we look at the armor of God that is laid out in such a beautiful fashion in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. The very first thing that I want us to consider this morning is getting to know our enemy. In any battle, again, if you are going to be victorious, you must know your enemy inside and out. Even Jesus would teach this in one of His parables where He would say, which of you going to war, you're not going to first sit down and see if you can defeat him with 10,000 who has 20,000. What's Jesus teaching in that passage? He's just saying, know your enemy. Know his techniques. Know you can defeat him before you go against him. And what does the Bible tell us about our enemy in this passage of Scripture? Well, first of all, the Apostle Paul describes his name. If you'll note there in verse 11 of the context of the Scripture that we are looking at, the Apostle Paul clearly identifies him as the devil. What does that word devil mean? It's a word that you can look up in a concordance and you will see it throughout the scripture. The word devil there in that particular passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, it literally comes from the Greek word diabolos, which refers to an individual who falsely accuses. But that that word has just a little bit deeper meaning. It also comes from the word from which we get our English word, diabolical. Now what does it mean if an individual is diabolical, if you were to refer to an individual of such nature? It's literally referring to an individual who is extremely cruel and evil and mean. Do you know some cruel and evil and mean people in our world today? I'm not asking you to make a list. But there are people out there like that. But folks, there is no one individual. There is no group of individuals that you and I could get together today who would match the cruelness and the meanness and the wickedness and the evil which Satan himself is capable of. He is an individual who not only accuses continuously day after day after day, 
but he does so in a false manner. And that's very typical of him because John would describe him in the book of John chapter 8 in verse 44 as the father of all lies. That's all he knows. He's lied from the very beginning and nothing is ever going to change about him. And so he is an accuser, a false accuser, the meanest being that you and I have ever known. Not only does the Bible describe though our enemy by name, the Bible also tells us in this passage of Scripture about his nature. And go with me, if you will, back to verse 11 and note that the Apostle Paul writes and he says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at that word wiles. What does it mean? It comes from the Greek word methodia, which means deceit, crafty, or trickery. And so that teaches us how he approaches us. He is not honest. It goes right back to the point that we just made. He's a liar. He's the father of liars. And that's all he knows how to do. But I think we need to understand that he promises one thing and he gives us something else. I like the word from which we get the word miles or a wiles. It refers to one who works by methods. In fact, we get our English word method from the Greek word methodia. And when you think about a method, that simply refers to a particular way in which you do something. It's just like shaving. Every morning I have a method, and it's the same method that I use every single morning. I'm going to start in the same place, and I'm going to finish the same place. That's not like Satan. The Bible describes him as having wiles in the plural. Many different methods. There are many different ways that he comes at you and I over and over and over again. Imagine your life, if you will, that there is buttons all throughout your life. And this button makes you do this one. This make button makes you do that. And this button makes you do this. Listen to me, folks. Satan knows every single button. And he knows when to push every single button. And just when he thinks or you think that you have him mastered or you have overcome him, he will reach out to a different area because he has so many different ways that he approaches you and me. And his ultimate goal, his purpose in approaching you and me, Peter would describe it in the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 8 and going through verse 9, his purpose is destroy us. Peter would describe him as being sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The word devour there in the context of that scripture literally means to destroy. We understand devour, don't we? You ever seen an individual devour a plate of food? What happens when he devours that plate of food? It's gone. There's nothing left. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to come into our lives. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your spirituality. He wants to destroy your children. He wants to destroy your name. He wants to destroy your influence. He wants to destroy your happiness. And ultimately, he wants to destroy Your soul. That's what he wants more than anything in the entire world. And brethren, we can't let that happen. I think one of the things that that we also need to know about our enemy is not just his name and his nature, but we need to know that he has allies. He's not in this battle all alone. It's not just one being that we see in the scripture who is approaching everyone, but rather he has help in the wickedness that he is promoting in our world today. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, the apostle Paul teaches us two things, main points in this passage. Number one, our battle is not against people. Look at how Paul begins this text. We do not wrestle with what? flesh and blood. What's Paul trying to teach us? Our battle is not against people. Too often in life our attitude is that we are against this person or this person is against me and we will develop uh, perhaps a hatred or an animosity or a jealousy toward individuals. And brethren, I need to understand that the spiritual battle in this life, it's not against human beings. It's against sin. It's against Satan. And what Satan is doing is many times he uses individuals to work to get through to you and me. 
And so I have to understand, number one, that this battle that we are involved in, it's not against the people. Listen, folks, the people in the denominational world and the people who are not religious at all, I need to understand they are not my enemies. Remember, our battle is to save our own soul and to reach out to the souls of others. Those individuals are in a lost condition. And if we treat them like an enemy, we will never be successful in the battle. We'll never win them to Christ Jesus. I need to understand our battle is not against people. Our battle is against angelic levels of authority. How do I know that? Look at the text with me. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, brethren, I'll be the first to say to you that I don't understand everything that is being said in this passage of Scripture. But clearly, Paul is teaching us that our battle is not against flesh and blood. And clearly, Paul is teaching us that Satan has allies. There are those who are helping him. Brethren, there is a battle going on right now based upon this passage that you and I cannot begin to understand. And you know what that lets me know without all doubt? I need some help in this battle. Too often we enter the battle, our spiritual battle, all on our own thinking that we can defeat Satan and we can defeat his evil forces. And that's, that's not true, brethren. We need to understand where our strength is in the battle that you and I are a part of every day. And it is not, I'll say it again, it is not in ourselves. Too often we think it is. Too often we think that we can defeat Satan all on our own. How do I know that? How many times have you been to an individual that was perhaps wayward? You know they've become unfaithful. They know in their mind they've become unfaithful to the Lord. And then you try to get them to come back to church. You try to get them to make things right. And, and they will hit you with this. Just as soon as I get things worked out, I'm going to come back to church. You can't do that. What are they doing? They are trying to do... Who is the one who has gotten them out of church? Who has gotten them in the position of unfaithfulness to begin with? It is Satan. That's his goal. That's what he wants to do. You remember what Peter said? He's walking around like a roaring lion looking for the individual he can pounce on. He knows every button in your life and he can push them. And you cannot beat him on your own. How about this example? Maybe you, you have a temptation that you're struggling with. And over and over and over again, you just keep failing, keep failing, keep failing. Could it be that you are trying to overcome that temptation or that problem through your own power, through your own ability, through your own determination? And you'll never do it. I can promise you that. Because if we are going to win in this battle, brethren, and mind you, we can win, and we will win. If we are going to win in this battle, the strength that needs to be in our lives is the strength that comes from God. In fact, that's what Paul would say in the very first verse of this context where we are studying this morning. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul would write and say, Finally, brethren, be strong where? Not in David. Be strong where? Not in the power of David's might. But he says, be strong where? In the Lord. You've got to be number one in Christ Jesus if you're going to have the strength to defeat your enemy. And note, if you will, whose power that gets us through battle after battle after battle. It's the power of His might. That's talking about the might and the power and the strength of the Lord. Brethren, if we are going to win in this battle, we have to move ourselves out of the picture and rely on the only one who can get us through. The Apostle Paul knew that. That's why he would say in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through Paul who gives him own self strength. Is that what Paul said? What are y'all shaking your heads for? Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who does what? Who gives me strength. God is that strength. God is that power that will cause me to literally crush Satan. You can do it. But you've got to understand that the power comes through God and not through you and me. Well, I've been a Christian for 50 years. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care how many scriptures you've got memorized. I don't care how long you have been a faithful servant of the Lord. 
the Bible still says, Let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Never get to the point where you say, I can do this. Live every day knowing I can do this with God's help. That's what Paul said, and that's what we have to do. Now, not only do, does the Apostle Paul teach us in this, in this passage of Scripture that, that we, we, we need to know our enemy, and he teaches us about the power that we, we need in order to overcome, in order to win this battle. What he does is he tells us about an armor. And he refers to it as the full armor of God, the whole armor of God, depending on what translation you're reading. But the idea is, is that God provides you and I with an armor that, that again, not only will we be able to defeat Satan in this battle, but brethren, we will defeat him to the point to where he cannot stand. And what we want to do in the remainder part of this lesson is we want to look at this armor that Paul describes for you and me. Because it's in the armor wherein that strength that you and I need is found. It comes from God that will give us the, the ability to be able to press through. Number one is Paul describes the whole armor of God. The very first thing that he refers to is your waist girded with truth. You've got to keep in mind that when the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, it's known as, the book of Ephesians, as one of his prison epistles. And at this particular time, not only is he imprisoned, but he is probably completely surrounded by Roman soldiers. Not the fact that they are huddled around him, but most likely being under house arrest, there is a Roman soldier in the house where he is saying, and everywhere he went in Ephesus, that's all he saw was Roman soldiers. He's writing to these people who likewise were very aware and acquainted with Roman soldiers. And what does he do? He talks about their armor. And he makes a comparison to the spiritual armor that we need in our spiritual battle. And the very first thing he talks about is the waist girded with truth. Now, a Roman soldier would wear what was known as a belt or what we might think of as a girdle. Now, a lot of times we think of a girdle today, we think, well, that's something that a woman wore. Well, that's something she wears today. But in this day, it was referred to either a belt or a girdle. There were two purposes of this particular belt. Number one, it held things together together. Number two, it gave him the ability to be able to go forward in life. Maybe he would keep his sword here or maybe he would keep some other weapon stuck down in it. But those two purposes, it kept things together and it caused him to be able to go forward in life. I need to understand that truth does the very same thing for me as I enter into battle against Satan every day. Number one, truth causes me to be able to go forward. How is that? Because of what it frees me from. The Hebrew writer would say in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Have you ever stopped to think about what sin does to us in the life of a Christian? The Bible says, or the Hebrew writer would say in this passage of Scripture, it literally weighs us down and it ensnares us. It traps us. But what does truth do for you and me? Truth frees us. Jesus would say in John chapter 8 and verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will do what? The truth will make you free. My question is, what is truth? That was the question that Pilate asked Jesus. What would Jesus say? Jesus would say in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Here is truth, brethren. And what is it that the truth, the Bible, God's word does for you and me today? Just like it causes that individual to, to have things in order, it gives him the ability to set things straight. That's exactly what truth does for you and me. It, it causes us to be able to hold things together in life. When everything bad seems to be going wrong, truth, we can appeal to it time and time and time again. And what will truth do? It will help us pull our lives back together. Think about when an individual is experiencing sickness. What will truth do? Pull their life back together. Think about when an individual goes through terrible temptations. Maybe they even give in to those temptations and they sin. What will truth do? It will cause us to pull our lives back together. 
What do we do when death strikes and takes someone that is so dear and close to us? Again, we appeal to truth and it helps us to pull things back together. And not only, brethren, does it cause us to pull things back together, it gives us focus, it gives us purpose, it gives us direction, it causes us to be able to go on in life. Thy word is a what? Lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. You see what truth does for the soldier? It causes us to be able to go forward in life. But look at the second part of the armor that Paul describes here in Ephesians chapter 6. And that is the breastplate of righteousness. Now every Roman soldier that you would have seen in Paul's day and age, he was going to have a breastplate. It was usually made of bronze. And this particular breastplate, it would go from usually the bottom of the neck down to the middle of the thighs. What was its purpose? Its purpose was to protect those vital organs that kept you alive. Mainly your heart that pumps blood and your lungs that gives your body and your mind oxygen. And so that was its purpose, to to protect those vital organs. Brethren, there is a vital organ that you and I have in our spiritual body. And what is it known as? It's known as our heart. Our heart. And then when you think about the heart, the heart in the sense that we read about it like in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37, in that particular passage of Scripture, when the Bible speaks of the heart, it's not talking about the mind. How do we know that? Because we are commanded to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so that lets me know that the heart is different from the mind in that particular passage of Scripture. The reason I say that is because many times we think of the heart, we immediately think of the mind. And that is partially true, but not always. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Sometimes when you see the word heart in the Bible, it refers to the center of life. What is that motivation? What is that strength, that that determination that keeps you going in life? And we have to protect that. Why? Because the moment that we become a Christian, the moment that we become soldiers in the Lord's army, immediately what Satan is trying to do is he's after our heart. You see, when we become Christians, the center of our life is who? It's Jesus Christ. And He's the only one we think about. And He's the only one we live for. And Satan knows that. And so continuously He's going to come after us because He wants to be the center of our lives. And that's why the proverb writer would write in Proverbs 4 and verse 23 and say, Keep your heart with diligence. What does Solomon mean? Protect your heart. Build a fence around your heart. Why? Because you have begun to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about what Jesus said, You shall love the Lord thy God with all your what? With all your heart. You see, God has to be the center of our life. And Satan doesn't want that. And so what we do is we protect our heart. Now question, how is it that we protect our heart? Remember, we put on the breastplate of what? What is it called? Righteousness. You see, that's the way we protect our heart. Through righteousness. Not my own righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ, as we read about in Philippians 3 and verse 9, and be found in Him, in who? In Jesus Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that is which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. You see, it's the faith of Jesus Christ that makes me righteous and keeps me righteous and keeps my heart protected. Where do I learn about righteousness? I learn about righteousness in God's Word. Psalm 119, 172. My tongue shall speak of your Word. For all of your commandments, they are what? They are righteousness. You see, when I'm obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, I become righteous in the eyes of God. And then when I live by this book every day, then what I do is I build a fence around my heart. And Jesus remains the focus in my life. We need to be those people that we put on the breastplate of righteousness. But as you continue to read on in the text, there's there's another part of that armor that Paul is going to describe, and it is the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, a Roman soldier's sandals were very unique. This is just one illustration 
of a Roman soldier's sandals. But at the bottom, there would either be very sharp spikes or there would be worn spikes like the ones that you have here, or perhaps cleats. The purpose of these cleats or spikes on the bottom of their feet or their shoes was to, number one, give them stability. Once they planted their feet down, they were there. But number two, it would also give them the ability to be able to go forward. Because if they would plant their feet in a certain direction, it would give them the forward motion. And when they would enter into battle, they could take another step and go forward, and another step and go forward, and it gave them the ability to be able to press on and to push forward even when they were going against a very difficult enemy. Do we not realize that the gospel of Jesus Christ does the very same thing for you and me? Often we think about the gospel in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 where Paul would write and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. We think of the gospel as that element that just saves us. And that's true, brethren, without a doubt. But not only does the gospel save us, not only does the gospel give you and me stability, but the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us the ability to be able to press forward in life. Without the gospel, we couldn't go forward. Because you see, with the gospel in my life, it lets me know that I'm a Christian. With the gospel in my life, it lets me know that I'm saved. With the gospel in my life, it lets me know that heaven's going to be my home someday. And when I have those thoughts just rolling around in my mind, it gives me the ability to be able to go forward even when my enemy is coming at me ever so hard. And therefore, brethren, we need the gospel in our lives. No doubt about it, when we think about the gospel of Christ, it gives us the power to go forward in life. But there's another part of this armor that the Bible describes, or the Apostle Paul describes, and that is the shield of faith. Now again, a Roman soldier would have a shield that he would often use as he would go into battle. Most of these shields were about two feet wide and about four feet long. Their purpose protect them. It would protect them against a sword. It would protect them against an arrow. It would protect them perhaps against a spear. And what was so interesting about these shields that if they would put their shields up in front and then the men behind them would put their shields over their heads, then they were almost unstoppable. Many times the enemy would take arrows and they would dip them in what was known as pitch, which was a flammable substance, and then they would light it and they would draw back and they would shoot those arrows. And so you've got all of these fire arrows coming through the air. But when those soldiers would put their shields up, it would even ward off those fiery arrows that were coming their way. It was a shield that protected them. And the Apostle Paul said, we need the shield of what? We need the shield of faith. What is faith? Faith is that which you and I have which causes us to become a Christian. You will not have an individual who will be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ if it does not begin with faith. Faith is our foundation. Faith is what causes us to repent. Faith is what causes us to confess our faith in Christ. Faith is what causes us to be buried in the watery grave of baptism. Faith is what's causing you to be here this morning. It's your faith. And it's your shield. And there are going to be times in life when Satan is going to shoot his fiery darts toward you and me. And whatever those darts may be, whether it come in the form of a trial or maybe a temptation or some kind of sickness or or whatever it may be, it's our faith that wards off those darts time and time and time again. And brethren, Satan knows that. And the moment that you and I become Christians, he begins to attack our faith. And he wants to see doubt come within our minds. And so over and over again, he's going to fire at you and me. And what do we need to do? We need to focus in on our faith. I I love the attitude of the apostles. When they come to Jesus and say, Lord, increase our faith. Brethren, that needs to be our attitude. Our attitude needs to be every day, God, make my faith greater today than it was yesterday. Why? Because it's our faith that will cause us to press on in this battle. Think about the words of the Apostle Peter. 
1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now I want you to look at this next part, brethren. Focus on it. Who are kept by the power of God through what? Through what? Through faith. The word kept there means guarded or preserved. Brethren, that's our shield. It's our faith. What causes us to press on for this living hope that Peter is talking about? It's the faith that you and I have that it's really there and that God's going to give it to us someday. And so our faith, our shield of faith will cause us to be able to win in that battle. As Paul continues to describe this armor, he then describes an article known as the helmet of salvation. Again, a Roman soldier, if you had seen one, especially if he was about to go into battle, he would always have on his helmet. The purpose of his helmet was naturally to protect his head. You see, his head was that part of his body that controlled his body. It gave him the ability to, to have the motor skills that he has. That, that, that's what our mind does for us. And so that head needed to be protected. The Bible says that we need the helmet of salvation. In other words, we need to have our mind protected. You think about salvation. If you are a Christian this morning, you've got salvation. But have you ever stopped to think about where salvation dwells where does it exist it's in your mind you see salvation is right here you see when I do what the Bible says and, and I know through a good clear conscience as Peter would talk about in the book of first Peter chapter 3 in verse 21 we would talk about baptism the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us not the putting away of the, the flesh but the answering of a what good conscience or a clear conscience. You see, salvation exists here because I look to the Bible and I see what God wants me to do and I do it. And brethren, the moment that we enter into a saved situation, a saved relationship, immediately Satan begins to work on our mind. He wants to create doubt. He wants to cause an individual to question their salvation. He wants to cause an individual to question the teaching of the Bible concerning the church or the practices of the church. And so He is going to continually come at you and I. And what we need to do is we need to have that helmet of salvation where it exists right here in this book. The more we read and the more we study, the more confidence we have in our salvation. That's why the Apostle John would write in the book of 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 13 and going through verse 15, and he would say, we can know that we have eternal life. How did John know? Because through the reading and studying of God's Word, it gave him more and more confidence. And the same is true of you and I today. We need the helmet of salvation. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, the Apostle Paul would write and say, If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things of the earth, on things above, not on things of the earth. You see, that's the key. It's what we think about. And when we are always thinking about heaven, and we're always thinking about what we need to do in order to make heaven our home, and brethren, we're putting on that helmet of salvation every day we live. There's another article that's part of this weaponry or this armor that Paul discusses, and it's the sword of the Spirit. And most of the time we think of a soldier's sword in that day and age. We might think of the Excalibur sword, something maybe that was used like in movies like Braveheart or something like that, these really long swords that you've got both hands and they're swinging him back and forth. But most likely that was not the size of a Roman soldier's sword. It, it was most likely a small sword of about two feet long. Why is that? It, it was there ready and, and, and handy where he could snatch it out and he was very fast and quick with it so he could destroy the enemy. And the Bible says that we need to have the sword of the Spirit. Now what I love about this particular part of the armor is the Bible clearly identifies what the sword of the Spirit is. It's what? It's none other than there in verse 17, as the Word of God. 
Now how can we apply the Word of God to a soldier's sword? Just like that soldier knew his weapon. And he could jerk it out and he could use it effectively. Brethren, if we are going to defeat Satan, we must know our weapon. We must know God's Word. And that requires us reading and it requires us to study and it requires us to meditate. Why is it that the blessed man is referred to as being happy in the book of Psalm chapter 1 and verse 2? Because the Bible says, or the psalmist says, in his law he meditates day and night. Every day he's taking this book and he's just soaking it in like a sponge. He's committing passages to memory, putting them in his heart. Why? As the psalmist would say, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not what? I might not sin against you. And brethren, if we are going to be effective in our battle, we've got to take the sword of the Spirit, we've got to take the Word of God, and we've got to make it a constant part of our lives every other day. Now, there is one other part of the armor. Most people will stop right there, but I think there's another element. When you think about the temptation of Jesus and and you think about the fact that, that, that over and over again, every time when he was approached by Satan, how did he respond? He responded with Scripture. It is written. And that's what you and I have got to do. If we are going to defeat him, we've got to appeal to Scripture. Now, let's look at that final point that Paul describes. And that's praying always. As we said, many times people will start with, stop with the sword of the Spirit. But brethren, I think we make a great mistake when we do that. Because after Paul describes the, the, the armor of God, he turns right around in verse 18 and he says, Praying always. Think about a Roman soldier. If a Roman soldier was going to be effective, if he was going to win, he had to keep the line of communication open between him and the centurion soldier. He had to communicate with him. And if he did not stay in communication with him, then the battle was going to be lost. How would he know where to fight? How would he know who to fight? How would he know where to go and what to do? He wouldn't. And so he had to keep that line of communication open. He had to be ready and willing always to approach that centurion. And likewise, brethren, if we are going to win in the battle, as we we spoke earlier, we cannot do it alone. We need God's help. How do we communicate with God? Through the avenue of prayer. And that's why the Bible teaches us that we're to pray without ceasing. Men ought to always pray and not to faint. In other words, don't become lazy or slothful in your prayer life. Be the kind of individual that you're always looking for the opportunity to pray. Now I want to tell you something, brethren. I'll ask you something. If we are asking God every day, every day we get up, tomorrow morning, God willing, you're alive and well, you're going to get up and you're going to go into battle against Satan. If you ask God, God help me, what do you think He's going to do? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Not. What's going to happen? It's going to be open. That's the God we serve, brethren. He's not going to keep back anything from you and I that we need. And if we are praying to Him always, and brethren, when the Bible says always, that's exactly what it means. Don't treat prayer like a fire extinguisher. Don't treat prayer like it's something that you're just going to use in an emergency case, but treat it like something like you would a relationship. You talk to your spouse every day. Talk to God every day. And when we are praying to Him every day and asking for His help, what is He going to do? And the battle will be ours. The whole armor of God. Brethren, we need it. And we've got it. This battle that you and I are a part of every day, it's a very vicious battle. It's a very struggling battle. It's a very draining battle. But we've got the power. It's found in God. And we've got the power. It's found in the armor that He provides for you and me. And if we will keep pressing forward in life, then we will win. We've just got to have the determination that we're going to fight We're going to put on the whole armor of God and we are not going to end until we get to the end of the battle. You may be here this morning and you are not a child of God. As always, we want to encourage you to become one. Come believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, the Son of God, and, and let us baptize you for the remission of sins. And you leave here this morning a soldier in the Lord's army, ready for battle. Maybe you're here and you're already a child of God and your life is not right. Maybe there are some things that, that you know you need to change. Then, then do that now. God's giving you this opportunity. Don't pass it up. Whatever your need may be, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?